So the Sermon on the Mount, which we've been in since May, I think, it's been a while, uh, is about the gospel. And we've seen that the gospel isn't just a matter of me and God, it's also about me and other people. It's about the way other people get treated in light of what Jesus has done in and for me. And so I, when you put your faith in Jesus, you earn this righteousness you couldn't possibly get on your own. And that doesn't just connect us to God and change that relationship. It changes all of these relationships as well. And so we saw last week, Jesus tells his disciples what? Don't judge other people. Don't condemn other people. Give them the benefit of the doubt. Give them grace and mercy. Why? Why does he say that? Well, because we've all been given grace and mercy. And Jesus himself, who doesn't need grace or mercy because he's perfect, even he in the book of John several times says, look, I'm not here to condemn anybody. And so we can't condemn other people. The gospel changes that relationship. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we can trust him with our souls and with our lives. And because of what Jesus has done for us, we can trust him with other people too. And so we can lovingly bring guidance to someone, but it's not our job to write anyone off or shut them out. Now this week is going to seem completely disconnected at first, but there's still a connection there. It still ties into the way we treat other people. Let's take a look at it in chapter 7, verse 7. This is what Jesus says. He says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. The first thing that I see here is that Jesus wants us to ask. He wants us to go to God with our concerns. He wants us to go to God with our needs and our wants. He wants us to ask. He's saying, bring your request. Ask, seek, knock, please. Just go to Him. Go to the Father. He wants us to bring those requests. He's, he's practically begging the disciples here. And he says that everyone who asks, receives. Like, think of the golden ticket this is that he's throwing out there. Everybody who asks, receives. Everyone who knocks, the door gets open. Everyone who seeks, finds. Just ask. I mean, there's that progression there, that ask, seek, knock. There's this persistence about it that might even sound kind of annoying to us, right? Like if someone's pestering us, we get fed up. Like, all right, I get it. I heard you the first time. Man, that's cool. <laughs> Leave it alone. It's like my little dog, Pepe, my little corgi, who he just loves to play fetch. It's his favorite thing in the whole world. You'll be sitting on the couch, and he'll just run over, drop a toy, run around, run over, drop a toy. He just never stops. It's just constant. Just is always, he's always, he doesn't wear out. He's so tiny and so much energy. And so it gets a little annoying. You're like, Pepe, knock it off. But he's persistent. And so we see something like this and we might feel like, well, I don't want to bother God. I don't, I don't want to be annoying. And Jesus goes, no, 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 no. Ask, seek, knock. Go for it. I'm, we're welcoming it. Please, do. You're not bugging him. And I think there's this idea that we get sometimes that it's self-centered of us to bring our requests before God. And I guess that can be the case if you're sort of treating him like this cosmic vending machine or something like that. Like, that's true. But I don't think that's where most of us are. I'd be willing to bet that most of us, the problem is that we don't pray enough. And honestly, there's quite a bit of humility to asking Him 
for things. Why is that? Well, because when you ask someone for something, you're admitting that you can't do it on your own, right? And so for some of us, it's like, well, we don't want to admit that. I mean, even little kids, right? Right from the jump, like as soon as they start to be able to do a little bit of things, like, no, I want to pour the milk. No, I want to put the cereal in the bowl. No, I want to get the spoon, right? They don't want you to do it for them because they can do it for themselves. I want to be independent. I mean, we can be the same. I mean, I, that was totally me as a little kid. Like, no, I'm going to figure this out for myself. Don't tell me what to do that. Honestly, that's still me now, really. Like, that's... <laughs> No, I want to do this myself. I'll figure it out. And so when I ask someone for help, it's an admission that I can't do it. And that's a tough one for some of us. I know it's a tough one for me sometimes. And so, you know, we can, if someone asks us for help sometimes, we'll sort of give them grief back because we know they could do it on their own, or maybe we think they could. Have you ever asked someone for something and they said, what, your leg's broken? Like, you know, it's like you could do this on your own. When we're asking, that's sort of this statement that we, we need the help. And so when we bring our request to God, what that's doing is it's allowing him to be God and us to be human, to go, I can't do this on my own. I need help here. Can you do this? Can you get this? Can you bring this? Can you make this happen? And so a verse like this, I read it, and it makes me wonder, like, how much do we not have because we've not been asking for it? What would we have if only we had asked? I think what Jesus wants to get across here is that God listens and he cares. I think most of us would say, yeah, I agree with that, absolutely. Before today, you would have said, sure, yeah, God listens and he cares, absolutely. But how often do we act like it? Do we, does our prayer life actually bear that out, that we believe that God listens and that God cares? What I love here is that Jesus is trying to motivate us to be prayerful, not with guilt, not with like, oh, well, you got to spend more time in prayer. You're not going to be super spiritual like everybody else. Like, that's not what he's doing here. He's going, just ask. Ask, and he'll give you. He wants to bless you. He wants to give you. He wants you to find what you're looking for. Ask. Go on. Come on. Bring it to him. Just bring the request. Seek. Knock. Bring them. Please. And we can bring those requests to him because of who he is. God is good, and because He's good, we can bring our request to Him. Jesus is hammering home here how good the Father is. He points out that we all give good gifts to our kids. Almost all fathers want the best for their children. They all want to give them the best. How I many? Probably many of you have either heard someone say, or you yourself have said, I just want to give my kids the things I never had, Right? And so Jesus is pointing out, like, look, like you as, as father, like you want to give your kids the best. Maybe you're like me and Adrian, you don't have kids, but you have furry children. Yeah. <laughs> want to give Pepe the best. Just <laughs> love giving him treats and toys. I get so excited and it's so adorable. But if we'll give good gifts to our children, then how much more is God going to give good gifts to his? Jesus just kind of like throws out, like, if you who are evil, like, by the way, <laughs> you're terrible, and you get this right, so how much more is God going to get this right? How much more does he delight in giving good gifts? How much more is he going to be a better example of this than we will be? And now this can be a tough one for some of us, absolutely. Absolutely. Because Jesus wants us to see God as the good father. And maybe you didn't have a great relationship with your father. Maybe you've had a bad experience there and that makes it hard to latch on to this illustration. And I think part of the reason why that happens for us is that we try to parse this in reverse. Where 
we think about our fathers, and then we put on those lenses, and that's the way we view God. Like, we look at him through those lenses of the way our father was, and we put those characteristics on him. And I think that's backwards. The reality is that we should go the other way around. We should take a look at God, take stock of who he is, take note of all of his characteristics, and then use those lenses to look at our earthly fathers and see where they may show or not show those characteristics. And so when you see a good father here, what you're seeing is you're getting this small window into the good father. You get a little glimpse of what he's like. And so the fix for bad fathers is not no fathers, it's the good father. And so Jesus appeals to us here, come, ask him. He's good, seek him, knock on the door. There's two thoughts that I think he really wants to get us away from here. The first is that God is so divine that he can't be bothered. And this is a way that I struggled with for a long time. I felt like I was bothering God by bringing prayers to him. That somehow, like, for asking for help, I was being annoying or something. And so I thought I had, like, this spiritual maturity that I was demonstrating by not coming to God and asking him for things. It's like, I don't need it. I'm good. I'll handle it on my own because I'm so spiritually mature. It's such a weird way to approach things now that I look back on it. Like, I was really trying to make the argument that I was more spiritually mature because I prayed less. Like, that doesn't make any sense. And so I realize now that there's one word that describes that mindset that I had. That's (laughs) self-righteousness. I thought I could do it all on my own. I thought I was good. I didn't need anything else. And so I had to come to grips with my own limitations. I, I thought I didn't need help. Little did I know. And so I didn't want to pester him. I didn't want to bother God. Only later to realize that I was bothering him by not bringing requests to him. Jesus says, come, ask, seek, knock. He wants to help. It's what he does. And so we're not doing God a favor by keeping our requests to ourselves. We're actually robbing from him the joy of giving his children what they ask for. The second thought I think Jesus wants to move us from is that we are so bad that we shouldn't ask. Like, it's, it's cool, this applies to everybody but me because I'm so bad, I'm so far gone that he doesn't want to hear from me. Phone's off, my red phone is off the hook. Like, it doesn't, it's just dial tone. Like, it doesn't, you don't want to hear from me, I'm too bad. I was too messed up to deserve the help. And this is one that, you know, has been a struggle for me at times, too. Like, self-esteem's not always been, like, a hallmark characteristic of, my, of me. Um, and it wasn't necessarily that I was being humble, because it's not humility. I was still being self-centered. I was just being negatively self-centered, which is really the worst way to do it. Because if you're going to make it all about you, at least enjoy it, right? <laughs> But being too far gone is kind of the whole point. Jesus doesn't say, blessed are the nickel short in spirit. The ones who are like, ah, I was close, but I had to reach into the take a penny, give a penny thing. And I, I, got, I, was, real, I was almost there, though. That's not what he says. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's not that we get real close, but we eh, just miss it. I get real close to God's standard, and I just, ah, as arms reach, if I grew my fingernails out, I maybe could have made it. Like, No, it's like you miss it drastically. Blessed are the poor in spirit. And so you can't be so bad that you can't bring your request to the Father. It's not possible. If it was possible, it would be true for every one of us. And so the reality is, the reason we're told to bring our request to God doesn't have anything to do with us. It's not rooted in who we are or what we've done or anything. It's rooted in who God is. 
It's all about him. We can bring our requests to God because he is good, because he is the good father who cares for us and wants to give good gifts to his children. We can trust him. He is good. He is trustworthy. And so because of that, we can bring our request to him. Now, of course, a passage like this raises some questions. What happens when we don't receive? What then? And I've been well acquainted with not receiving in my life. I'm currently walking around with a giant unanswered prayer request in my health. Like uh, I've been praying, others have been, been, others have been praying, I'm still in chronic pain on a daily basis. My mother has still not been healed of her nerve disease. And so I can understand how frustrating it is to have an unanswered prayer request. Something that you wish God would take away, whether that's a health problem or a sin issue that you just want to be free from, a job you thought was perfect and you didn't get it. I've been there. I live there now. I have a condo on Unanswered Prayer Island. Right? And I say that because I can understand how frustrating it is sometimes to get the answers that people will give you for why your prayer request has not been answered. Where people say a lot of things with the right intentions doesn't make you want to kick them in the shin any less when they say them, right? Like, yeah, God has a plan. Great, thanks for that. That really helps right now. And so I'm going to give a couple answers that might possibly be the reason why you've not received what you've been praying for. Um, they are not the only answers. These are some options. The reality is, for any given situation, I have no idea why God has not chose to act there. That's why He is God and I am not. But there are some things in Scripture that help us think through this that we'll take a look at. The first is sort of this verse in James that some scholars think is almost like commentary on this Matthew passage. That he's directly commenting on what we just read. It's in James chapter 4 and verse 2. He says, You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so there's two reasons that he packs in right there. The first is that we don't ask. It's like, are you really praying about it? Or did you like maybe kind of sort of pray and you filled out a connection card, but you didn't really take it a step farther than that? You haven't really been seeking him about it. And it's a tough one because depending on what it is, it can be hard to keep praying about it because you just get frustrated and you get like, well, he hasn't done anything here. I'm just so frustrated. I can't keep praying about this. I get it. Sometimes we have to ask to receive. But the second reason that James gives here is the one I really want to touch on. He says, you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. When we're asking for the wrong thing or for the wrong reason, we might not receive. See, when Jesus gives this instruction, it's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. It's towards the end of the Sermon on the Mount. You get the point. And so he wants us to view this in light of everything else that's come before. So there's this incredibly high bar that he calls us to uh, ethically. There's this deep dependence on God that he's trying to trigger in us by doing that. And then he teaches us to pray, and he teaches us to first pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. So it's all, all prayer is to be in that light with that in mind. So if we're praying selfishly, there's a chance we might not get an answer. We're praying for things that would boost our passions. By this, James means our wrong passions, not our right ones. Like, suppose you could say I'm passionate about the Cleveland Cavaliers. But it's not in some outsized, idolatrous sort of way. I just like watching them play basketball. And they maintain a good chunk of my wardrobe. So what James is talking about here is he's talking about sinful passions that pull us away from God. If we're praying for things that feed those, God's not going to grant those requests. If we're asking for things that are going to drive us from him, 
we don't want him to grant those requests. And so he won't. And the second reason is sort of connected here is that God only gives good gifts. Jesus touches on this in the passage. If your kid asks for bread, you're not going to give him a stone. If he asks for fish to eat, you're not going to give him a snake. You wouldn't do that. So we wouldn't give bad gifts. God doesn't give bad gifts either. He only gives good gifts. God gives no stones for bread. And so we've got to do away with this notion of like, well, I don't want to give my life to Jesus because then he's going to make me go to Africa. Or I don't want to give my life to Jesus because then he's going to make me some kind of weirdo. Like He doesn't give stones for bread. He's only going to give you what is good for you. He only gives good gifts. And so that means that God won't give us bad things even if we ask for them. So if something's going to separate us from Jesus, it's going to diminish our passion for Him, He's not going to give it. It would be bad for you. You don't want Him to give it to you. If your child asked for a pet bear, you wouldn't give it to him, right? Because despite what Yogi and Boo Boo would lead us to believe, they do not only eat picnic baskets. <laughs> as much as your child may want a bear, it would destroy them. And as much as some of the things we want seem great to us, they would destroy us. And so God's not going to give them to us. The catch here is that some of the things that we think are good are bad. Some of the prayers that go unanswered, though, could be the greatest gifts that God has ever given to us. I think about there's this old song by Garth Brooks called Unanswered Prayers. That's right, don't act like I don't know my Garth Brooks. <laughs> As a child, I cried because I missed his going away concert on TV. <laughs> This is way before DVR kids, so there was no like going back and watching that. It was gone. I had the big box set, everything. I was like, hip hop, classic rock, Garth Brooks. I was a weird kid. <laughs> Correction, still am a weird kid. <laughs> but he's got this song where he talks about he goes to this high school football game with his wife, and they're in town. They go back, and he runs into his old high school girlfriend, who he had like prayed every night that this relationship was going to last forever. And he meets this girl and introduces his wife, and he walks away like, bullet dodged. <laughs> and the chorus is like, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Who among us cannot relate to the story, right? Facebook has let me have this experience a time or two, I will say. You're like, wow, bullet dodged, right? <laughs> There are times when you'll look back on something you prayed for and be so glad that God didn't give it to you. He knows what He's doing. And so if we ask for something bad, He's not going to give it to us. He's not going to give us something that's bad for us, even if we think it's good. On the other hand, there are some things that we think are bad for us that are actually good. I mean, I think about what my illness has produced in me from a character perspective, the ways that it's forced me to sort of grow in my faith. Uh, and I think already it's a net positive. That said, I'm ready for it to be over. But on the whole, it's been good. Ready to stop it, but I'd do it again. I've been disappointed that I haven't been able to read like I would want to, uh, but there are some lessons that I'm learning through this that I would never learn in a book. And so I've got to remember that God only gives good gifts. It's hard sometimes to see how some of these gifts could be good, but they are. Think about my grandma who used to give some pretty interesting uh, birthday and Christmas gifts on occasion, like just random stuff that you'd open and your face, you wouldn't be like trying to hide a disappointed face, you'd be like just confused, like, what? Uh, like, did I open the right gift? Like, what's going on here? There was one time she gave Adrian and I a warming tray set, um, 
Like it's got like a warming tray and then there's some serving trays that kind of snap into it, uh, keep party food warm and stuff. Uh, this was our first Christmas married and we got this and we were like, thanks? <laughs> Not on the list, <laughs> didn't really. But I'll tell you what, not even a week later, when we go back to D.C., New Year's Eve, we're having a bunch of people over, making a bunch of food. I'll tell you what came in handy. <laughs> warming tray set. Now, I mean, we're not breaking this out every week for Taco Tuesday or anything like that. <laughs> but the few occasions that we do need this thing, it actually is really handy. Adrian's doing a cake pop uh, station thing for this uh, women's event for Recreate coming up. And... Was, we were talking about it the other night, and it's like, well, she needs to keep this like candy coating melted. You now it's great for that. Warming tray. <laughs> Ruby knew what she was doing. And that's kind of a goofy example, because she, like, there are sometimes that we'll get things from God, and we're like, this isn't good, I don't want this. This is not what I signed up for. But it'll be more helpful than we ever realized it could be. What's so awesome about God is that this extends far beyond like some weird kitchen tool. Like this is everything that we encounter in our lives. It's good for us. It may seem impossible that it could be, but it's for our benefit. Go to this verse a lot in Romans 8:28. Paul says and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. This verse is not a promise that bad things won't happen to you. If anything, it's a promise that they will. But when they do, he's taking them and he's turning them into good. It might take until you're standing before the throne one day for you to realize how this was good, but one day it'll all make sense. We can come to God confident that he's only going to give us good gifts. When we don't receive, it may not be a good gift that we're asking for. The hardship that we're enduring, that may be a good gift in disguise. And then Jesus ends this verse with a sentence that seems completely disconnected to all of this. He says, So, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. What does this have to do with that? And he starts it so. So I'm not just making this up here. He really is connecting this. Like, so, because of all this, now do this. And here's what the connection is. The golden rule is only possible because of who God is. Think about it. We have a generous father who, I mean, to say the least, he only gives good gifts. He gives them to his children when they ask. The goodness, the generosity he has here is outstanding. And so what does he call us to do then? Be good and be generous to other people. Because we have a generous father, the world should have generous disciples. There are a lot of rules and sayings in Jesus' time that look something like this. For the most part, there was one big difference. They were all negative. They were all phrased, whatever you don't want someone to do to you, don't do that to someone else. Which, still, good rule. But that's not how Jesus says it. That's not what he says. Jesus doesn't say, well, just don't do the things you don't want done. He says, whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. He makes it active. What do you want other people to do for you? You do that for other people. That change makes a world of difference because it's a whole lot easier to just not do the things that you don't want done. You can still be standoffish. You can still keep people at arm's length. You can leave people alone, not be bothered. But that's not what Jesus calls us to here. He doesn't give us that. He wants us to be active. He wants us to be the ones reaching out. It's a call to creativity, is it not? Whatever. That could encompass a whole lot of things. Whatever you wish that others would do to you, you do that to them. Whatever you can dream up, do that for people. Take off the WWJD bracelet 
put on WWIW. What would I want? And then do that for other people. That's what we're called to do. That's how we're called to treat people. The golden rule, he says, it sums up the law and the prophets. The whole Old Testament, he says, all the teaching there. This is it in concentrate. This is it distilled down right here. Doesn't require great expertise. Doesn't, you don't have to know the words that Jesus used in the Greek to understand how to do this. This frees us from the reign of experts. He says, whatever you, don't, whatever you want people to do to you, you go do that for other people. So how do we treat people? Well, the way we'd want them to treat us. Why can we do that? Because Jesus has given us access to the Father who we see as good and generous. He sets pace Himself. And in our interactions with Him, that rubs off on us. Then we can be good and generous to other people. And so that's the basis for all of this. Is that God is good and generous. And so what are we missing out on because we haven't been asking Him for it? He loves to hear our requests. He loves to give good gifts to His children. So bring them. Ask. Seek. Knock. Bring those requests. He wants you to bother Him. And then as we seek Him, as we seek the good and generous Father, let's be creative in being good and generous to other people. Let's extend that same magnanimous character that God shows to us to the people around us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank You that we can trust You because You are good and just. Lord, help us to see the opportunities to extend Your goodness and Your generosity to the people around us. Help us be creative in being the body of Christ and being salt and light in demonstrating Your Gospel to the communities we live in, the community we work in, to our families, our friends, and beyond. Lord, drive away from us this notion that we're too bad to come to You or that You don't want to be bothered by us. And Lord, stir in us a passion, just this desire to run to the arms of our Father. We thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen.